Right. Thank you. We are in recording mode now, and we had stopped at line 620 approximately, where <coughs> Satan had uh, uh, been uh, on, was on the verge of making his final speech uh, in book one, that is, in book one, <coughs> exhorting his fellow angels to rise and join the fight. Right. So uh, now that they have arisen and they are all in formation, he now gives the battle cry uh, in the uh, imitation of the <coughs> speech of the classical uh, general. Uh, right. So now he's in this mood. Uh, oh, myriads of immortal spirits, so powers matchless. But with the Almighty and that strife was not inglorious, though the event was dire. So he's always at pains to suggest that the fight that they had, the battle that they had was glorious, even if they have lost. As this place testifies and this dire change hateful to utter, he recognizes that every stage that his change is hateful, that, uh, that there is a certain degree of despair which oozes through the speech. But he forever suppresses it and moves forward. But what power of mind, foreseeing or presaging, from the depth of knowledge past or present, could have feared how such united force of gods, how such as stood like these, could ever know repulse? So he's saying, we had our best intentions. We just did not know that divine force could be so powerful. For who can yet believe? Though after loss, that all these puissant leg legions, powerful legends, who, whose exile hath emptied heaven, shall fail to reascend self raised and repossess their native seat. This uh, sort of providing them hope, he's suggesting that, you know, who could have believed that we would not have risen and taken our heaven? For me be witness, all the host of heaven, if counsels different or danger shunned by me, have lost our hopes. So uh, <clears throat> there is this within, if you look at Satan's uh, speeches, though they are very rousing, there is always <coughs> this bitterness at being defeated. And there is also a sense of despair at having lost their earlier state of heaven. So Satan seems to oscillate. Satan seems to move between despair, bitterness, envy, and also resolve. So it isn't that Satan is all resolved, although his speeches might appear like that. But within the speeches, there is a tension that shows this continuous oscillation between despair, between a state of <clears throat> perfection having been lost, and the resolve to fight. Uh, keep on fighting against uh, God. So his regal state put forth that full, but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. So he's almost blaming God. He says God did not let us know what his strength was. So we fell. Uh, we were tempted to fight and we fell. Henceforth his might we know, but now we know his might. Now we know that we cannot fight him straight on. Therefore, our fight will be with guile. Our fight will be a guerrilla warfare. So, henceforth is might we know and know our own, so as not either to provoke or dread new war. Our better part remains to work in close design by fraud or guile. Now, this is going to be the strategy that, you know, uh, uh, the serpent will use. So you see, associated with the serpent is guile, is deceit, is perversion, right? So Satan will not now engage in direct warfare against God because he realizes God is infinitely more powerful. What he'll do is try to weaken the, uh, the creations of God. So what force affected not, that he no less at length from us may find who overcomes by force overcome but half his foe. So overcoming by direct force, he says, 
is just half of it. Now, you remember that this might be an allusion to the Trojan War, where after failing to defeat the Trojans, the Greeks actually sort of uh, engaged in guile. So, uh, guile is, according to Satan, because it is uh, applicable in classical wars, a valid war strategy. Space may produce new worlds, whereof so rife there went a fame in heaven that he ere long intended to create. Now, this is where the first reference to the rumor that God is creating a new kind of species is approximated. So, for the first time, we learn that Satan, uh, I'm sorry, that God is creating a new species. Uh, he intended to create and therein plant a generation, a new species, that is man, whom his choice regard should favor equal to the sons of heaven. So God is making Adam in his own image. And Satan has got wind of this. Right. <clears throat> Thither, if but to pray, shall be perhaps our first eruption, our first breaking out, our first expression. So we will not be able to fight God directly. But we may be able to fight God with, uh, in, 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 by fighting man, we might be able to fight God. So, but if to pray shall be perhaps our first eruption, thither or elsewhere, for this infernal pit, this hell, shall never hold celestial beings in bondage. Now, that word goes back and forth, that we'll not be held in bondage, we'll not be slaves nor the abyss long under darkness cover. So these thoughts full counsel must mature. But he says we must have a full meeting for this. We must strategize. So we need a hall for strategizing our new kingdom. Peace is despaired. For who can think submission? Now this is again, you see, the, the kind of a Republican Milton, right? Advocating that never will submission slavery, complete tyranny, rule, we will always resist. War then, war, open or understood, must be resolved. Now, this element of, uh, of Satan's quality and this ambivalence is something that I've always harped on. And in my next class, probably, which will be uh, questions, a discussion on questions on Paradise Lost, I'll come to Satan separately. So hold your horses today. We will uh, take a very close look at Satan and uh, his uh, sort of relationship with the contemporary Miltonic world in a separate lecture. Uh, I will definitely discuss this. Right. But let me first take you through the text. Uh, so war then war. And you see that rallying cry open or understood must be resolved. Understood is in the sense covert. He spake, and to confirm his words, out flew millions of flaming swords. So they take out their swords and, you know, cry to battle. Drawn from the thighs of mighty cherubim, the sudden blaze far round illumined hell. High they raged against the highest. You see, this is again how the epic style functions. High against the highest. A progressive amount of what you will call exaggeration. Or hyperbole and fierce with grasped arms. And also notice how Milton is using the assonance, the repetition of vowel sounds, the, the use of harsh consonants, as it were, to create this sense of hard battle being fought. With grasped arms clashed on the sounding shields, the din of war, hurling defiance towards the vault of heaven. You see how very carefully the use of masculine vowel sounds, I'm sorry, consonant sounds are deliberately used to suggest this, you know, military uh, sort of uh, almost the, the pace of marching within the, uh, within the uh, verse. They stood a hill and now he, for the last section of uh, this book, <coughs> Milton will talk about the creation of pandemonium. Now, uh, pandemonium is a word which is created by Milton, 
right? So you had the classical pantheon, the residence of all gods, and pandemonium is the residence of all demons. It means all demons. So it's a binary to pantheon, really, the pandemonium. They stood, and this is the residence of the dem demons, the counseling hall of the demons. They stood a hill, not far whose grisly stop, you know, it's a horrible, horrible uh, hill, belched fire and rolling smoke. The rest entire shone with a glossy scruff, you know, a crust kind of a thing. So it's, it's as it were burning still in hell. Undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore. So once again, Milton is going back to these volcanic legends where it suggested that God created volcanoes and hid uh, his riches, his riches of different ores within the womb of the volcano that should not be disturbed. Natural resources should not be disturbed. But Satan and his forces, they plunder and ransack the inners of the volcanoes for their own creation. The work of sulfur, thither winged with speed, a numerous brigade hastened, as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe armed forever for run the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. So these are workmen, as it were, who build the fortifications around the army. Mammon led them all. And now this is the god that we were referring to, uh, the god Mammon, uh, let me just get back to uh, the uh, the the uh, uh, kind of uh, material that I had circulated, and you can see Mammon here. Mammon is the god of greed. Uh, uh, Mammon being one of the uh, one of the most horrible of gods who uh, provokes within man the 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 cult of money, usually at all. Uh, 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 at any cost, as it were, right? So uh, even before his fall, Mammon used to keep eyes fixed on the payments of, payments of heaven made of gold. So Mammon is always associated with gold and gold uh, wish. This made Mammon to have a stooping figure and is referred to as a lewd spirit. So he's obsessed with gold and riches and minerals and expensive minerals. Therefore, he becomes the one who will search out the minerals for pandemonium. Now, he later talked the trick of mining to human beings as well. So, uh, you know, Mammon becomes the, the most important god to, uh, to dig into the entails of the earth and find out the, the materials. Now, obviously, as with other, you know, people who have used Mammon as a kind of a, a figure, a symbolic figure, Milton disapproves of uh, Mammon's uh, you know, thrust, thirst for wealth and suggest that he resembles within man's soul human greed, right? And uh, this is also associated with the Catholic Church's, you know, uh, penchant for ornamental riches. And therefore, for the Puritan Milton, he was protesting against any form of excess of wealth. So Mammon becomes a target for uh, for uh, Milton, as it were, in the text. So they are led by Mammon, the least erected spirit that fell, least erected, most bent spirit, because he's always looking downwards. Forever in heaven, his looks and thoughts were always downward bent, as we uh, saw, admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than aught divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatific. So he's more engaged in in the vision of gold rather than in the vision of goodness. So by him first, men also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the center. So Mammon it is who has provoked men to hunt for gold, to dig for gold and valuable minerals, <clears throat> and with impious hands rifled the bowers of their mother earth for treasures better hid. Soon had his, soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound and digged out the ribs of gold. Let none admire the riches grow in hell, that soil may best deserve the precious bane. Gold is seen here as the bane, a kind of a poison because it corrupts human hearts. And here let those who boast in mortal things 
and wandering tale of Babel and the works of Memphian kings. You see how, you know, the Egyptian tombs and the Tower of Babel, the pyramids were all carved with golden, you know, ornaments and had enormous riches. So Milton is seeing them as, you know, as it were heathen people with, uh, with their greed and lust being their dominant gods and contrasting uh, the Puritans with them. So uh, learn how the greatest monuments of fame and strength and art are easily outdone by spirits reprobate. And in an hour, so uh, they can change with incessant toil and hands innumerable scares perform night on the plain in many cells prepared that underneath had veins of liquid fire slushed from the lake. A second multitude with world, wondrous art founded the Massey. Now, some of them collected this mass of gold and minerals, whilst the other mass, the first mass collected the gold, they are castigated as greedy. But the ones who molded this gold and minerals into shapes are seen as wondrous sculptors. Uh, so the bullion dross, a third as soon had formed within the ground a various mold and from the boiling cells by strange conveyance filled each hollow nook as in an organ from one blast of wind to many a row of pipes the sound board breathes and on out of the earth a, huge, a fabric huge a building rose and Milton is, uh, is sort of suggesting our sense of awe and wonderment at this new creation. Uh, rose like an exaltation with a sound of dulcet symphonies and voices sweet, built like a temple where pilasters, pilasters of columns round were set and Doric pillars overlaid. You know, in Greek architecture, you had the Doric, the Ionian styles, the Doric pillars, you had the pilasters of the columns uh, <coughs> were set in Doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave. Nor did they want cornice or frieze with bossy sculptures graven. You see how familiar Milton is with the art of architecture. So cornice or frieze are all elements of architecture that Milton is bringing in. So there is a divine, there's a very consummate architect who is looking after the creation of pandemonium. So the roof was fretted gold, nor Babylon, nor great al Cairo, such magnificence equaled in their glories. So neither the Greek Babylonians nor the Egyptians could have dreamt of such, you know, greatness. Uh, nor great al Cairo, such magnificence equaled in their glories to enshrine Belus or Serapis, their gods, or seat their kings, when Egypt with Assyria strove in wealth and luxury. So even in their greatest uh, moments of glory, the Egyptians or the Assyrians or the Greeks could never think of such grand, grandeur. Uh, the ascending pile stood fixed or stately high and straight the doors, opening their brazen fold, fowls discover wild within our ample spaces. So this is the new, you know, as it were, Indraprastha. And you had huge rooms and chambers uh, from the arched roof pendant by subtle magic Many a row of starry lambs and brazing cassettes, cassettes fed with naphtha and asphaltus yielded light as from a sky. So this is a new, you know, brand new uh, sort of uh, palace that has been created for Satan and the rebel angels with huge amount of spaces and huge amount of riches. Now this huge amount of riches in the palace uh, refers probably to the Catholic churches, which were rapidly becoming more, you know, storehouses of riches and paintings rather than uh, the houses of God. So Milton is not in favor of churches or great buildings being decked up with gold and material riches. He would rather want sparser, you know, much more, uh, uh, you know, basic buildings dedicated to God. The scripture helps the angels held their residence. Uh, no, I'm sorry. As for the, the hasty multitude that may admiring entered and the work, some praise and some the architect. So who is this architect? Who is this rebel angel who has built this? His hand was known in heaven by many a towered 
structure was sceptered angel held their residence. So he had built many of the towers of heaven also and sat as princes whom the supreme king exalted to such power and gave to rule each in his hierarchy. So God had even God had given him a lot of power and respect. The orders bright, nor was his name unheard or unadored in ancient Greece in and the Ausonian land. Men called him Mulciber. So this is the final, as it were, angel, Mulciber. He's the architect of pandemonium. And Milton seems to have a great respect for uh, for uh, Mulciber. Now, please remember that uh, uh, it is suggested that you know there was a cult of the Freemasons, as it were. Uh, the Masons were seen as magical men because they knew the art of the keystone. Now, in the arch, there is the keystone that balances the two sides of the arch, and the Masons who built these had, uh, you know, they did not divulge their art. So it was a kind of a magic. And the Masons were seen in great, uh, with a great lot of respect. And you had these associations of the Freemasons. And Milton was himself a great admirer of this modern ways of architecture. And therefore, he, uh, he looks at Mulciber with far less hostility than he looks at Mammon, for example. He suggests that Mulciber is mislaid, and despite being fallen, Mulciber's art remains uh, an art which is really praiseworthy and divine. So he was the architect of heavenly palaces as well, worshipped in ancient Greece as Hephaestus and in Rome as Vulcan, the god of fire, metal work, and forge. So, you know, you still have the word vulcanization of rubber. And Vulcan was the god of forging, the architect god, as it were. Milton says that the Greek people mistakenly thought that Vulcan was, Vulcan was thrown down from heaven, while in reality he fell with Satan in his, the dubious battle. Right. So uh, <clears throat> this is the god whom, uh, this is the fallen angel whom he talks about. Men called him Mulciber. And how he fell. Uh, from heaven, the fable thrown by angry Jove, sheer o'er the crystal battlements. From morn to noon, he fell. From noon to dewy eve. Take it. So, from morn to noon, he fell. From noon to dewy eve, a summer's day, and with the setting sun, dropped from the zenith like a falling star. On Lenos, the Aegean Isle, thus they relate, erring, for he with his rebellious rout fell long before, nor aught availed him now to have both built in heaven high towers, nor did escape by all his engines, but was headlong sent with his industrious crew to build in hell. So even though Milton admires him, he says that because he was with Satan, because he sided with evil, he was not spared, and he was sent by God to hell uh, along with Satan. So with his industrious crew to build in hell, meanwhile the winged heralds by command of sovereign power and with awful ceremony. So Satan now with a great amount of ceremony is going to enter into hell and trumpets sound throughout the host proclaim a solemn council forthwith to be held at pandemonium. The uh, high capital of Satan and his peers. So this is the high capital. Capital as in <coughs> the sense of the council hall of classical Rome. Right. And also the capital as in where all the major powers would congregate. Powers of the state of Satan and his peers. The summons called from every band and squared regiment by place or choice the worthiest. They and on with hundreds and thousands trooping came attended, all access was thronged, so all the gates were full, the gates and porches wide, but chief the spacious hall, to so the hall that has been built, the hall for council, though like a covered field, where champions bold won't ride in armed and at Soldan's chair, so, uh, so where people could ride around, and in the Sultan's chair, the Soldan, uh, Milton 
recurrently refers to Satan as the Sultan, as it were, in the Oriental despot, suggesting that Milton Satan is no less tyrannous than God, and at the Soldan's share defied the best of Panim chivalry, pagan chivalry, to mortal combat of career with lance, lance is the sword, thick swarmed both on the ground and in the air, brushed with the hiss of rustling wings. So the angels with their wings created a sound which was like the buzzing of bees, millions of angels creating a buzzing sound like bees. Now this is the last metaphor that Milton uses. The metaphor comparing the, uh, the angels to the bees, to the sun with as bees in springtime, with the sun with Taurus rides forth, pour forth their populous youth above the hive. So just as the bees come out of the hive in summer, similarly the angels come out into pandemonium, in clusters. They among the fresh dews and flowers spy to and fro, and on the smooth plank, the suburb of the straw-built castle, this is the, the, the hive, new rubbed with balm, expiate, and confer. So the, uh, the bees congregate around the hive, and it appears that they are uh, conferring with each other. The state affairs, so thick the airy crowd. And you see the bee, Milton must have known by this time, the structure of the bee with the queen bee uh, in the middle, and uh, him her sort of devouring all uh, the, the male who sort of uh, mated with him and the, all the bees serving the queen bee. In the same way, all the rebel angels are serving the queen bee, the lord of the flies, as it were, Beelzebub, who is Satan himself. So swarm with and strained till the signal given, behold a wonder. They now who seemed in bigness to surpass arts, earth's giant sons, now less than smallest dwarfs. So they become tiny and minute. Now, is Milton suggesting that they have magic? That they are moving from great shapes to very small beings? Or is it a kind of a moral diminution that they who were morally superior now have become morally extremely tiny and puny? So there seems to be a kind of a both of the meanings uh, involved here. So, uh, they who now seemed in brightness to surpass Earth's giant suns, now less than the smallest dwarfs, uh, in narrow room throng numberless. So, they become tiny and all of them are accommodated in the room, like the Pygmean, Pygmean race beyond the Indian mount of fairy elves, whose midnight revels by a forest side or fountain some belated peasant sees. So, Milton is also here not only drawing from the classical sources, but also from the, uh, uh, from the indigenous lores of the fairy elves who farmers see, whose midnight travels by a forest side or some fountain, some belated peasant sees or dreams he sees, while overhead the moon sits arbitress and nearer to earth wheels a pale course. They on the mirth and dance intend with joke and muse Music charm is here at once with joy and fear, his heart rebounds. So the elves who sing to the peasant and gladden his heart. Similarly, the uh, all the all the uh, uh, all the rebel angels they swarm like bees and fairies and elves around pandemonium. The only factor being that their hearts are not glad; their hearts are filled somewhere with a little bit of despair and hope, right? So, uh, at once with joy and fear, uh, just excuse me, just excuse me for a moment, please. Sorry, I'm alone in the house and so I have to 
containing snakes and all that. So, uh, reduce the shapes immense and were at large. Shona Jatsi. Sorry, 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 one screen. So, uh, reduce the shapes immense and were at large, though with numbers still amidst the hall of that infernal court. But far within and in their own dimensions like themselves, the great seraphic lords and cherubim in close recess and secret conclaves sat a thousand demigods and golden seats. So they now took their seats and this great counseling about what the next course of action will be starts frequent and full after short silence then and summons read the great consult began. So this is how, you know, Paradise Lost Book One ends. It starts with the fall of Satan and uh, begin, it talks about the fall of man. It begins with the fall of Satan, his uh, arousal then and his exhortation to his rebel angels who respond to his call and his announcement that henceforth there will be a great battle between God and evil, between good and evil, and that uh, Satan will reign in hell rather than serve in heaven and will be the the uh, will engage in endless and eternal war with good uh, if it means eternal war with god now there's only one very interesting thing in paradise lost book one that only once do we uh, have reference to uh, man in the sense that we had it in the invocation of course where Milton is stating the subject matter of the poem, but then he's talking about the entire poem. But in book one, there's only one reference to man, and that is when Satan articulates the rumor that God is creating a new race of people who he will make in his own image and he will make as his own son. And therefore, Satan's resolve is to corrupt this new race as soon as he can. And therefore, uh, this is about the fall of Satan. This is about the fall of pride. This is about God's power. This is about Satan also. His oscillation between despair, his tremendous resolve never to be subdued, uh, which articulates some of Milton's concerns, and also his moral decrepitude and his despair in realizing what he has left and his uh, surrendering to the cult of evil. This is what makes Paradise Lost Book One. Uh, and that is why, because it's so difficult a text, I wanted to read this with you in details. We've read almost 800 lines, if you can uh, see from the text, with annotations. And I've given you, you know, pictures and illustrations of, uh, of Milton's uh, uh, characters, rebel angels, we've talked about the spaces, and you see how uh, Milton is talking about the old Hebraic space uh, of Jerusalem, the chosen city, Mount to live, uh, and he's talking about Hebrew history, and he's also referring to the uh, neighboring heathen places where he sees the, uh, the heathen gods reside, for example, Greece or Syria, uh, he has, and parts of Israel. So this is his locus. Now also notice how Milton is drawing within the text metaphors from modern science, especially mineral ores. He has referred to Galileo and the new astronomy. He has also referred to volcanoes, their mining, and he's given us exact dimensions of space, including chemicals like sulfur. He's talked about the Dead Sea. He's talked about the brightness of the Dead Sea. Therefore, Milton is bringing within the poem, despite this being Christian epic, he's bringing within these, this poem a large number of elements from a large number of discourses. Now, in my next class, and this, these are going to be the two final classes on Paradise Lost, I will take a closer look at Satan. And I will try and answer Blake's query as to whether Milton was of the devil's party without knowing it. So he had a latent sympathy for <coughs> Satan. That is my first question. 
The second question that I'll tackle is how does Milton transform uh, or reinvent, it's not reinventing, inventing a Christian epic out of disparate elements, especially classical elements. So that is going to be one class which discusses these two questions. In the next uh, the final class, what I will discuss is Milton's grand style. How does you know the style facilitate uh, the kind of epic? While I will also once again talk with, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, how Milton's Paradise Lost uh, represents his personal beliefs and the contemporary political situation. So that Paradise Lost emerges not only as a classical or a Christian epic, but also a text which was extremely relevant for its times. So it is with these two classes that we shall bring our study of Paradise Lost to uh, a close. But for the time being, I would uh, I, I will stop the recording and allow you to ask questions if any.